Hello everybody, this is Brain Hacker Keith Barry and on today's show we got the one and only Keith Duffy. How are you Keith? Hey Keith, how's it going buddy? You all good? I'm very good thanks. What part of the world are you in right now? Man, I'm in Dublin. I've been in Dublin for as long as I can remember. This is the longest time I've spent in Dublin since I was about 16 and that's no joke. Yeah, you're not the only person who said that, but weirdly enough, there's a few people that I've spoken to on my show that actually decided to jump ship and get out of town and hide in various places around the world. So I was talking to some of you know, uh, not that long ago, Sean McGuire, and he decided to bolt up in Antigua, of all places, and get out of LA during all of this. But uh, but you're at home, so you've been spending a lot of time at home. At home. Like, how have you been passing the time? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, from lockdown to lockdown, things have changed. And you talk about Sean McGuire, I mean, he, he lives in L.A. I mean, both of us know him. I've stayed with Sean quite a few times up in Studio City, but he's not far from Studio City. Yeah. And he's got a beautiful house. The sun is shining. He's got a <laughs> swimming pool in the back garden. And he's jumping off to Antigua. I, I wouldn't know. mind jumping over there. I wouldn't mind going to his house while he's not there. Yeah, um, yeah. I Listen, do you know what? Let me just explain how this all started for me was Brian and I, Brian McFadden and I were on tour. We had just, yeah. we had just sold out a world tour from Australia to Copenhagen, from Dubai to Sri Lanka. And we were on the UK part of the tour. We had 24 shows done this time last year. Yeah. And we were right in the thick of it this time last year. And we had 24 shows done on the 15th of March, which was a Sunday. And Boris Johnson addressed the nation for the first time on the 16th of March, Monday, at five o'clock. We had a day off that day. We were playing Huddersfield the next day, which was Paddy's day, which was a Tuesday. Yeah. And uh, about five or six o'clock on the Monday night, we decided we we're going to have to come off the road. We were going to have to yeah, postpone the rest of the shows. And what we, we thought maybe for four or five weeks till this thing calmed down and we put the shows off and we postponed and we postponed again. And, and here we are a year later still sitting at home. So now, in fairness, to answer your question, the first lockdown was a breeze. And to try and kind of articulate how, it felt, how I felt, I spent most of my life on the road. You know, it's yeah. like that Paul Young song, wherever I lay my hat, that's my home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I've been on the road for 27 years and um, Jay, Jay is now 24. Me, me is going to be 21 next month. Wow. And, you know, everybody's grown up so fast. So to get the quality time at home with the family in our beautiful home that I completely take it for granted uh, in our beautiful garden, you know, because if you remember the first lockdown, the sun was shining. It was beautiful weather. So yeah, yeah. everybody was out doing work in the garden, doing work they've been putting off for 20 years. They were painting, they were cutting hedges, they were doing whatever. And we were no different. And I was just absolutely loving the quality time that I got to spend with my family that I'd never, ever, probably would have ever got again. And so I, remember that being, was a, I remember being a small part of that as well, because every kind of two weeks, uh, myself and yourself and a few of our friends would get together for a few drinks. But that didn't last too long, but it was there for a couple of months, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, we thought we had a hard then. And look, <laughs> looking back, that was the good times. Yeah. You know, co coming into the second lockdown, you know, the, the, the nights start getting darker earlier. The weather start changing a little bit, but we still cracked on. You could still go to the gym. You could still go to certain places, you know, pubs. Yeah. You know, we're serving food. You could go there. So you could still try and get out a little bit and socialize and see different faces. But I think everybody in this lockdown is really starting to feel it. And I think it's now you have to kind of dig deep and stay positive and, and just even in moments of madness when you're feeling desperate, you just, you really have to try and rein it in. Look at what you have got around you and not what you haven't got. Um, and when the day comes, ho hopefully, please God, when this lifts, you'll really appreciate the, 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 the best things in life, which are free. Yeah, like I, I put it in my own little way. I talk about reframing a lot as a kind of a hypnotherapist and as a, an executive coach. And what I mean by that is exactly what you said. It's okay, yes, it's difficult. Yes, you can be downbeat and downtrodden. But I think there's a few things that you can do. One is reframe the moment. In other words, you know, when you feel really down, actually just appreciate that you even have a roof over your head, whereas other people around the world don't even have that much. Um, and then appreciate the fact that if you've got you know the Wi-Fi in the house that you can get online and just imagine what it might be like to not have those kind of things. And then secondary, I think we need to be a little bit kind to ourselves, like go easy on ourselves. A lot of people are kind of beating themselves up to get things done. And I, I'm no different myself. You know me, I'm a bit of a workaholic, but and I'm not getting all the things done I want to get done. But ultimately, I think it's okay. It's okay to be late on certain things. It's okay to miss deadlines. It's okay to have a messy house at times and just be kind to yourselves rather than being kind to other people. I think sometimes we don't think about that. It's just actually, it's okay. If you had a couple of drinks on a Wednesday night, don't beat yourself up about it. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's a, a, an important fact. Now, listen, 
I know you quite a while, right? Uh, but there's a couple of questions I've never asked you. So I'm interested in a couple of things, given it, that it is the, the Brain Hacker series here. Do you believe in the supernatural? Um, th that's a bit of a weighted question, I think. Because, it is. Um, do I believe in the supernatural? I've experienced some supernatural activity. Which... Okay, tell us about that straight away. Tell me what you've experienced. Okay, so a good friend of mine who, who you knew as well, God rest his soul, was Stephen Gately, okay? Yeah. Now, Stephen, Stephen was very, very much in touch with the supernatural, okay? okay. He, he would tell you stories of growing up down in Cherry Street in the flats. He would tell you stories of how the Easter eggs at Easter would just fly off the roof of his mother's wardrobe wow. for no reason. In the middle of the night, the hairdryer would go on. And it, it wasn't a scary factor for them. It was just part of their life growing up in the flats yeah. in Cherry Street that, that there was other people living there that they couldn't see. And over the years of touring the world with Stephen, he told me various different stories, hotels that we stayed in. He'd ring me in the middle of the night and he'd say, Duster, can I come home and stay in your room? There's a ghost in my room, you know, yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm not joking. He would be absolutely terrified. He, he would be I'm dead sorry, serious. Sorry for interrupting, but it's important that I ask, what was your opinion when he was at, when he was telling you these things were happening? Like, did you take it as a pinch of salt or did you believe him? Of course, I don't mean that you questioned his own opinion on it, but what was your sense of the whole experience that he was going through? Well, I saw the fear in his eyes. So I believed that he believed yeah. what he was seeing to be true. I took it possibly with a pinch of salt. I'd never quite experienced anything. I'd never seen anything. I never doubted the man for a second because I could see in his face that he was being honest. Yeah. But like you just said, you, you gave me the answer I needed. I probably took it with a pinch of salt. I was a little bit kind of cagey about the whole thing. Yeah. But there was one night, it was um, what we call here in Ireland, St. Stephen's Day, better known as Boxing Day in the UK. And we had a bit of a gathering at our house. And we live in, the, in North County, Dublin, as you know. So there's plenty of fields and farms and everything all around our, our home. Yeah. And uh, I had a, a golden retriever dog at the time called Molly. And it was about half 12, one o'clock in the morning. We had people, like I say, we had a gathering in the house. And it was always about that time I would take Molly for a walk. And Stephen said he'd come for the walk with me. But like I said, he'd, he'd be very sensitive to spirits and stuff like that. Yeah. Extremely sensitive. So we went off walking. We weren't jarred. We might have had a few drinks, but I mean, we were we were house drinkers. Like we, we know who to drink. You know that. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. we weren't drunk. We weren't falling about the place, but we had got a few drinks on board. Um, but we went walking up and there's kind of as you come out of where I live, there's kind of like a, a two mile walk around the farm, the farm and you come back to a field. And it's a kind of a shortcut through the field and the dog Molly can get, get off the lead and run through the field and stuff. So I'm actually walking with my arm around Stephen and we're chatting away, shooting the breeze. And as we're coming through this kind of a forestry kind of field back to where we live, um, I could see this man in the distance, I would say about 50 or 60 yards in the difference in the forest with, a, with, a, with a, um, an overcoat on, with his back to us. And he was kind of bending over like a ditch in front of him. Right. Now, the closest house to this place was, 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 was one of my neighbours. And I, I won't say his name. Yeah. Let's, let's say Frank Murphy, for example. Yeah. Frank, Frank lived in the next house and Frank was a farmer. And... As far as I was concerned, Frank, I said to, I said to Stephen, what is Frank doing? <laughs> Bend over the ditch at this hour of the night. And Stephen's going, who's Frank? And I says, Frank, that guy there. And he goes, who's he? I said, he lives in the next house down. Yeah. And I kid you not. I kid you not. This is true as I'm sorry. Okay. I'm even getting goose pimples. The, the, the shadow stood up, still with his back to us, turned around and floated right over our shoulders. <laughs> oh, my like, God. I swear to God. And I, and I didn't know what to say. And I knew Stephen would be absolutely freaked out. He looked to me, I had my arm around him. He looked at me and he said, Duster, tell me you saw that. Tell me you saw that. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I, I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. I said, look, listen. And I just, for some reason, kept saying to him, there but for the grace of God, go I. Just keep saying that with me. Wow. There but for the grace of God, go I. There but for the grace That's of God, go I. And we got back to the house and we told everybody, nobody believed us. They all laughed at us. Yeah, yeah. Me and Stephen. We, we, and I don't know, is it because I had my arm around him and I was like, I was engaged with him yeah. that I saw too. Maybe if, if we were standing apart, he would have only seen it and I wouldn't because he, he had, with it, what's it called, a sixth sense or something? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But um, yeah, so I, I mean, now I would never doubt or, or deny anything. Well, that, well, that's fascinating now because look, that's the first time I've heard that story. But like... I think everybody has had some kind of supernatural experience. So here was mine, right? Uh, I was getting ready for, and I, I've never shared this experience with anybody. And that's what this series is about. It's about people opening up to me and me sharing back. So 
I remember I was getting uh, ready for one of my tours, which was called the Dark Side. So the Dark Side was based around Aleister Crowley. So Aleister Crowley was known as kind of one of the wickedest men that ever lived, right? Uh, he was like this very strange, weird character. He lived up on the banks of uh, Loch Ness. Uh, so when I was getting prepared for that show, I had a whole bunch of Ouija boards in the house. So when Maraid would go to bed uh, with our daughter, Brianna at the time, Braden wasn't born, uh, she would go to bed. I'd burst out the Ouija boards and I'd literally be sitting there in the sitting room on my own, right? And I'd be kind of in the dark and I'd be like, if there's anybody present, give me a sign. And I'd be trying to Ouija board on myself. And me being the ultimate skeptic, nothing ever kind of happened except one night I was in the sitting room and I was there for about, I'm gonna say an hour and a half without moving and just with the Ouija board and playing around and trying to think of new routines. And one of Brianna's toys, like a soft toy, which was battery operated, but it had been in the middle of the floor for the full hour and a half that I was there. And I said, give me a sign. And the second I said, give me a sign, that toy, that little fluffy pink uh, doggy, just turned on and walked across the room all by itself. Now you could call that a coincidence, right? But then later on that night, I went into my office. So this all happened the same night. I went into my office and I was still mucking around with the Ouija board. And one of the Alice, so I have a huge library, as you know, but one of the Alistair Crowley books fell off of the shelf. So I still, I got a fright. So I'll be honest, I got wow. a fright. But I still put it down to a coincidence. But then one final thing happened that night, which kind of freaked me out. So I remember I had one of those little blow, it was the winter time, and I had one of those little blow heaters, you know, those small blow heaters. And it was yeah, cold, yeah. so I had that on in my office, which is where the book came off. And I remember specifically, like, I, and I hadn't any alcohol in me at all. So I remember really specifically going, okay, that could, kind of a fire hazard, I better turn that off before I go to bed. So I turned it off. So I, I remember specifically turning the blow heater off. Off I went, up to bed, got up the next morning, went down, and I could kind of feel heat coming out of my office. And I walked into the office and the blow heater was on. But the second I walked in, the red light went off. And it had been on all night, even though I remember turning it off. So that was kind of the most supernatural experience that I went through. Now, look, being the ultimate skeptic, I still wonder, like, was it just a coincidence? Did I really, did I, did I misremember and not turn the heater off? Like, did a battery just turn on when it was, but anyway, I, I'm just fascinated by that world, as you know. So I thought you were going to tell me that it wasn't even plugged in and there was no batteries in the furry no, no, toy. No, it was, plugged, it was plugged in, but look. I mean, I suppose really, who knows, right? Uh, you know, and uh, like as a, you know, when it comes to religion, personally, I'm a, an agnostic. In other words, I'm very happy. I'm not an atheist, but I'm an agnostic, which basically means for anybody who doesn't know, I'm very happy uh, just in my own life to say, I don't know. I don't know what's out there. I don't know if there's a God. Perhaps there is. I hope there is. I certainly have hope, um, but I just don't know. Uh, what's your own religious uh, beliefs? Or do you have any at this moment in time? Well, I, I, was, I was brought up like most kids in Ireland um, in, the, in, in the Catholic religion. Um, and as a, as a kid, my folks would ensure that we went to mass every Sunday. Well, yeah. they'd kick us out of the house at the time to go to mass. But what we would do is we'd go to the church and we'd go in and get the leaflet and we'd go and hang out the back <laughs> of the church until mass was over. And we'd go home to the house and give me mom the leaflet to pretend I'd be in the church. <laughs> and, unless it was raining, of course, and then we actually would go to church yeah, yeah, because yeah. we didn't want to get wet. Um, but it was all those years, really. And I didn't realize until later on in life that it did kind of embed some great faith in God within me. And um, again, ironically, it comes back to Steo. Um, when, Steo when Steo passed away, it, it was a really shocking time. And uh, it, was, it was ghastly because you don't have the emotional tools to deal with the loss of someone that's not sick or old yeah. or expectedly you know, unwell. Um, so you find yourself in a place where you don't know how to feel. Your emotions are completely all over the place. And, yeah. and I, ultimate, I ultimately started having really nasty nightmares which prevented me from wanting to go asleep unless I was drunk. Yeah. And that wasn't, a, that's no answer, you know? Um, but ultimately what I used to do to try and get myself asleep without having these nightmares was say decades of the rosary, wow. um, which, which I learned because when I was, when I was young, I had a brother that's two years older than me and a brother five years younger. But before the younger brother was born, there was a lot of, of the extended members, the older members of my dad's family and my mom's family who, who were passing away, as, as I was yeah. like four or five or six. So I, I went to an, a lot of funerals as a kid. And as we all know in Ireland, going to the funeral, going the night before, you do a load of decades of the rosary around the coffin yeah. and stuff. So the rosary was the one prayer that I knew. I wanted, I, I suppose what I needed at the time was to be able to, um, um, to, to meditate, to yeah. try and take my mind off something and put it somewhere yeah. else. Oh, something. And, yeah, and yeah. the best form of meditation I could find was prayer. And I knew prayer. Um, so to answer your question, 
Um, I have I have my own great belief in in the greater being of God, the Creator yeah. of heaven and earth. I have a great belief in Mother Mary, the Mother of God, the Virgin Mother of God. They're my beliefs. I I kind yeah. of if it's allowed. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any rules, but I kind of take the parts of the Bible and the parts of faith that have been taught that I like, that suits me, and I've kept them. And anything that doesn't really appeal to me or I'm not really interested in, I kind of push to the side. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a big mass goer. Um, no. uh, a couple of times a year, obviously, it's, I think it's important at Christmas, you know, to acknowledge that it's not only Santa, Santa Claus coming down the chimney, but it was the birth of Christ as well. So, yeah. you know, I wouldn't be over re- religious. I certainly have great faith and I have my own beliefs that, that, that keep me functioning on highs and lows of my life. But actually, I think there's a little snippet to be taken away from that. And what was interesting to me is, and you put it actually quite eloquently, you might not even know that you did, but like saying the deck to the rosary for some people could be another person's form of meditation. And yes, it's religion, unless a lot of people might come from that from a, an area of pure faith. Um, but and other people might take from that actually, you know, they might go back to doing decades of the rosary and it could be their moment to just go internal and uh, have that moment to both themselves and perhaps to, uh, you know, another being, whoever uh, that may be. Now, with that being said, uh, you know, I thought I'd move off topic here for a moment. Look, what would today be without doing a trick on you? So here's Absolutely, the brother. Bring it on. I've got a deck of cards here, but here's the thing now. Let me tell you about this deck of cards. You are going to pick your card from this deck. Now, I don't mean any card. I mean your specific card. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to attempt to influence you to pick your card. Your job is to actually genuinely resist my subliminal influence. Now, you might notice some of my influence because it's going to be linguistic. So let me start now. There's two different colors predominantly in a deck of cards. There's red and there's also black cards. Now, are you ready for the experiment? Yes, ready to go, brother. Okay, good. Now, once you're ready to go, do you want red or do you want black? Your choice. Red. Red. Interesting that you went the opposing way that most people might have gone with because you think perhaps that was a double back bluff the way I was trying to influence you. Interesting that you went for red. There's also hearts for the lover and there's diamonds, of course. Now, of course, you know, Valentine's Day is a wonderful time of the year. So would you like hearts or would you like diamonds? Your choice. Hearts. Hearts, okay, so you're gonna go with hearts. Then there's the ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, or king. You got two seconds to think about this. What card would you like? Two of hearts. The two of hearts. Now you might've just followed my lead there because a lot of people might think, oh, well, Keith was being obvious. This Keith, not that Keith, was being obvious and that maybe I was trying to guide you towards the two of hearts. And you went actually towards the ones that I was subliminally influencing you to go with. So perhaps, perhaps people might just think that you're playing along. So I'm gonna tell you now, if you want to change to just a completely different random card right now, you can change to a completely different random card, including the suit. So do you want to change? Or are you going to stick with the two of hearts? Okay, no, I'll change. Oh, okay. What are you going to change to? Oh, you want to know? Yeah, yeah. Just so everybody knows. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll change to the eight of hearts. The eight of hearts, because I'm going to go through the deck and find it for you. Okay, so the eight of hearts. So I'll go through the deck. We'll find the eight of hearts. So remember, he changed his mind completely to the eight of hearts. There it is right there. I'm going to take it out and I'm going to just pop it in my top pocket here so you can kind of keep an eye on it there, okay? So I told you you're going to find your card, but what I didn't tell you is on the opposite side of the cards, there's names, Keith, okay? These are names okay. of people that I've performed for in the past. So we've got Ryan there. That's Ryan Sheridan. We've got Anna. We've got Cora, Sophia, Lily, Isla Fisher, uh, Julia. We've got James, Bella. They're all different. Kylie, Kylie Minogue. Kylie Minogue actually picked the three of spades when I was performing for her, but they're all different uh, they all have different names you could have had any card but you went you went for the eight of hearts and i told you at the very top end of this that you would find your card and keith you found it brilliant <laughs> brilliant <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> i knew well, i knew you were an eight of hearts kind of person you know what i mean not a two of hearts you were never going to be a two of hearts i think i know you i know you over 15 16 years and i still get blown away by it. it's unbelievable so, so tell me, I know that you've been on the road, you mentioned it earlier, with uh, Boy's Life, and it's important, I think, so it, here's an opinion just for myself, I think enter- entertainers specifically have gotten a bit lost in the mix with coronavirus, and, and I mean lost twofold. One is there isn't really a voice explaining that ultimately, just like yourself, back uh, March 10th last year, I was on stage performing to a packed house in the Olympia Theatre, and the next day the rug was pulled and I, you know, I didn't have any live gigs, just like yourself. So there's no real voice for us, but more importantly, I, I don't think people really understand that it's in our DNA to be on stage, and that 
a lot of entertainers, uh, even wedding singers, you know, comedians, perhaps just, uh, you know, people who are just working entertainers, they've lost their sense of purpose right now. Um, how are you dealing with that? Like, do you feel that loss inside of you of having not been on stage? Because you've been on stage for 20 or 30 years, uh, pretty much every couple of nights at this yeah. Yeah, it's very tough. It's a real tough one. And it's, 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 it's tough to the degree that even the people that I surround myself with, obviously my family or whatever, my friends, they, nobody would really have any concept of, of, of that loss that you feel because yeah. it's, it's something only somebody that's been on the road as long as we have can understand. Um, being on stage every night is, 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 is magical. You know, I mean, I've wanted it's to do it since I was a kid. I was blessed, you know, that my dreams came true with Boyzone back in 92, 93. You know, what's that, 27, 28 years ago now? Yeah. Um, you know, that, that infamous kind of first night on the Late Late Show, um, you know, where people still look at it. And it was only on last week because on my social media, I've got fans DMing me saying, oh, saw this on TV again last <laughs> night. You know, 28 years later, people are still getting a laugh out of it. I mean, I was 18, guys, 18, 19. Give me a break. But, you know, from there we went on to super success, which, which is unbelievable. And it's only now when you get to stop for a while and slow down and take kind of take take a little bit of time to look around and see where you've come from. You know, we spend so much time looking to where we want to be that we forget yeah. to look to see where we've where we've already been. And you know, nights like playing Wembley for the first time, nights you know that we were flown in by private jet to go on stage in front of two hundred thousand people and sing with Pavarotti and sing with Joe Cocker and and then you know being being in the in the, in the sweetest thing video I with you too. I, I have to stop you now. You see, I have to stop you. Sorry for interrupting, but like. Here's a little thing about me that you wouldn't know. Like Joe Cocker is pretty much my favorite singer in the world ever. So I can't believe I, I didn't know this. I didn't know that you got to sing with Joe Cocker. That must have been just phenomenal. Well, it was unbelievable. And, and now that I know that you're a fan, I'll give you a, a deeper story to that part. Um, so at the end of this particular show we were on, there was Joe Cocker on the bill, but it was Pavarotti and Friends. So at wow. the end of the show, there was Joe Cocker, there was Lionel Richie, there was B.B. King. There was Gloria Estefan, there was Mariah Carey, there was Ricky Martin. Um, there, I mean, it was unbelievable who was there. Yeah. But they, they, they choreographed the last song where all the artists come out on stage together. There was a full 30-piece orchestra. There was a full live session band all playing together. And the very, very last song was the song, We Are the World. You know, we are the world. Yeah, yeah. We are the children. So I had to share a microphone with Joe Cocker because we were doing the same oh. line together. <laughs> oh, I would have loved Because for me, my kids are 12 and 9, as you know, and I'm trying to play all kinds of music for them. And I don't mind them listening to, you know, any kind of music, whether it's just simple uh, modern day pop, rock, whatever it is, techno. But I'm trying to get them to listen to the likes of Joe Cocker, um, you know, Elvis, uh, you know, Queen, Freddie Mercury, all these different styles of art. It's just so they have an eclectic mix of music in their head. But Joe Cocker, oh, my God, I I'm slightly. Is, can we find footage of that online? Is it up on YouTube? You know. Yeah, no, it is. It is. There's a, there's footage on YouTube of firstly boys on singing with Pavarotti. We, yeah. we we sang no matter what with uh, so we sang the first verse of no matter what, and then Pavarotti kicks in with his operatic no matter what version, which was just like the hairs in the back of your neck standing up. Amazing. It was amazing. And um and then at the end there's a there's a there's a swoop of a camera on YouTube, and you can see. Mariah and Shane Lynch and Ronan, and then you can see Joe Cocker, Mikey, and myself, and then Lionel Richie and whoever. But well, what yeah, we'll the, the, is, the, what we'll do is we'll find the link to that, Keith, and we'll put it into uh, the description below, so people can click on the link on the description below, and they can find uh, Keith over there singing with Joe Cocker. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, very well, like I say, it was it was Pavarotti show, but but. Uh, I, I actually I, I got to have a few points with him in the in the in the bar the night before the gig as well. Which wow. there's, there's another story I'll tell you off camera. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple more questions for you, and then we'll wrap it up. So real quick, what I, I, I'm going to tell you what mine is first, so so you can understand, you can answer this any which way that you want. But I'm going to ask you what your guilty pleasure is. Now I'll tell you mine first while you're thinking of yours. My guilty pleasure, my guilty pleasure in life. I can't believe I'm letting people know this. My guilty pleasure is every day. Every single day, at least one episode of Judge Judy. I love <laughs> Judge Judy. I mean, I think she should run for president. Uh, she's a sh straight talker. She sees through all the, the bullshit in life. Uh, so anyway, my guilty pleasure is Judge Judy. I'm dying to meet her. I'd love to perform for her. So anyway, she's my guilty pleasure. Who would your guilty pleasure be? Who do you enjoy watching or listening to that perhaps wouldn't be the most popular choice of, uh, of people around there? Um, I don't know. It's a tough one. I mean, 
t- the TV over lockdown has been funny. I think one of the biggest shows in every household in the UK and Ireland has been The Chase with Bradley Walsh. Yeah. I think it just, everybody seems to be watching that show. Um, I was on that show just over two years ago and um, I was up against Anne Hegarty and uh, they kind of thought, listen, let's offer the thick Irish man 60 grand. He'll never go for it. And um, I said, yeah, I'll go for the 60 grand. And I won. And we won the final Matt. chase. And we got uh, myself and Rachel Riley and, and some guy from Emmerdale Farm. And we got 66 grand for 22 wow. grand each for, for our charities. But I got 60. They only got six between the two of them. <laughs> um, so I don't know. My guilty pleasure. Um, Come on. It must be a song. It must be a, a person. Do you know what? Do you know what? I, I'm watching on YouTube. Um, and yeah. like, I'm, I'm so not computer literate. Like, I'm so bad with technology. It's not true. It and with smart, tele- with smart televisions now, you can do so much. You get, you get remote controls that you can talk into the top of them. And it comes up on the TV what you want to do. You can flick your screen onto the screen in front of yeah. you. I've no idea how to do any of that. But Jay, yeah. who, who, you, who you know well, yeah. Jay's very good at picking up that type of stuff quite quickly. So he's been teaching me how to get YouTube and all these things up onto our smart TV. Yeah. And what what I've really enjoyed doing now, I know he's not president anymore, thank God. But some some of Donald Trump's uh, speeches and talks and debates yeah. and arguments, I just love watching them. I, I cannot actually believe that there was a moment in time when that man was actually president. I, know, I mean, yeah. what, what was going on in the world, for God's sake? And I just I, I love watching people impersonate him. I love, yeah. I love watching him trying to answer back some of the questions from the journalists that he literally just doesn't answer and skips by. Yeah, I just yeah. think how bizarre was it that he was actually a president, you know? And it's yeah. a guilty pleasure every day having a little Donald Trump fix, you know? That is a guilty pleasure. So listen, it's very important for me to uh, make sure that the people watching this right now, they know how to follow you as Keith Duffy, they know how to follow uh, Boy's Life, Boy's Own. So what have you got coming up? Where can people find out about your upcoming gigs? Because I do know you're going to go back to gigging, hopefully in the second part of this year. So let us know. Yeah, well, um, I started off, I, I, I was in a show in London back at the end of 2015 into 2016, uh, called A Handful of Stars, which was a play written by Billy Roach, uh, a Wexford man. And it was, it was one of, of three plays, uh, a trilogy that was on, in the, uh, was on in, the, in the tricycle in London back in the 80s. And it was, it was a great show. I played a character called Stapler. And I done, I've done quite a bit of, 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 of uh, straight theatre, as you know, yeah, with, with the, great, yeah, yeah. the great production company Druid in Galway. Um, I did a John Bean Key play, uh, Big Maggie. I played Teddy Heenan. I've done that quite a few times. Yeah, that was um, amazing. My, my, my stage debut as an actor was um, a show called Dandelions that Fiona Looney, the journalist, wrote. And I was in that with Deirdre O'Kane and Paul, Pauline McGlynn. But yeah. when I was finishing up A Handful of Stars in the West End um, back in 2015 to 16, I started thinking that I'd love to do a one man show. Like I, I'd love to, you know, that, that, that excitement, that fear before yeah. you stand out on stage, especially when you're in the likes of the Trafalgar Studios and it's in, that, in, it's in the half round and I've got like an 11 page monologue to walk out on stage a stapler and remembering your lines. The, like you see the whites of, 100, there's only 120 seats in the place. It's a yeah. small th- theatre, but to see the whites of the eyes of 127 people looking at you while, you're, while you have to remember all these lines and stuff. I just thought being a stand-up comedian must be the toughest gig in the entertainment business. Um, I mean, actually, a brain right. hacker and, and a comedian is <laughs> not, not, not easy either. either. <laughs> so anyway, to cut a long story short, I, I, I wrote a kind of, it was like a by, um, what you call it, not an, an autobiographical show yeah. about 25 years in the music business. And my idea was to tell stories such as the Pavarotti story I just told you, and then to sing a song that reflects that story. And I was just about to launch the tickets and put it on sale. And I, I kind of got cold feet. I kind of started thinking most of the time in Boy Zone, I was a backing singer. I never got the chance to sing lead vocals. And yeah. 25 years of doing backing vocals takes away your confidence a little bit. You need, you need to, you know, you have to have confidence to perform to the best of your ability in anything yeah. that you do. So anyway, I got talking to Brian McFadden backstage at a gig he did in Wheelands. He asked me what I was doing. I told him, he said he'd love to do something like that. I said, do it with me. I'll, 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 I'll rewrite the show. I'll make it about both of us, your experiences in Westlife, my experiences in Boy Zone. We'll call it Boy's Life and we'll put it on sale and we'll see how we do. Yeah. We sold out the whole tour in four hours. That was back in 2016. We sold out the second tour. Four gigs into the first tour, we sold out the second tour. Um, but it, it evolved from being an autobiographical show to an actual concert. Um, and then it evolved from just like uh, the O2 Academy style venues to theatres and city halls. 
and we got a full live band behind us and we put it into a, into a full concert with bells and whistles. Yeah. And if I'm honest, if I'm honest with you, it's the best job satisfaction I've had in 27 years as, wow. as, as in my career, because I spent eight months vocal training, getting my confidence ready to be able to sing song, lead vocal after lead vocal after lead vocal. Brian is superly talented. He's got a great voice. Amazing he really, voice. really, he really helped me get the best of me out there. And between the two of us, we've worked really hard and we've built this great brand and we're very fortunate now. It's taken us again at our age. It's taken us again all over the world three or four times. I mean, it's it's huge in Australia and New Zealand. It's great in Southeast Asia, uh, yeah. Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, down to India, Sri Lanka. Um, for the first time in boys in boys zone, we never really did a lot in Scandinavia. Now, boys life, we're flying in Denmark and in Sweden, all of Scandinavia, Europe. So we 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 were on the the, the we were on the 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 wings of of, of a dream really, and, yeah. and the pandemic happened. So we're looking forward to all our shows have been rescheduled for September, October, November this year. And um, it's on all our Boys Life socials. And um, you'll find them on, on, on my socials and Boys Life socials. Yeah. You'll be able to find the tickets. A lot a lot of the tickets that were already sold have been moved on to the new shows in September, October. So anybody that has a ticket, it's valid for the shows that are coming up in September. Okay. So I think. Because everybody's trying to book venues, it's very hard to get a tour yeah. put on sale. So it's a very sporadic tour. Like we're doing maybe 12 nights in September, then nine nights in October, and then 11 nights in November. We can't get them in a, in a touring mode. Yeah. So it's kind of like throwing darts at the map. But it's all we can do to get back to work. And we want to get back to work, so we're not complaining. You know? well, I have to tell you, I think it's fantastic because for me... I haven't thrown the darts at the board yet. I don't know when I'm going back to performing live. I'm talking to MCD here in Ireland all the time. Um, and we're trying to figure it out. But look, I'm delighted that you guys are getting back on the road and you've got those dates locked in. I think, you know, I think we need that. We need you. We need, uh, we need the likes of Boys Life on the road to entertain the masses because I think, look, uh, you know, virtual performances, uh, they've been a lot of fun for me, but I cannot wait to get back to performing live. And I think yeah. people really need it. They need the likes of you. They need the likes of Brian, like Brian. Um, you know, I didn't realize it until the first time I heard you guys sing live. Um, you know, your voice is very good, but Brian's voice is amazing. You know what I mean? And the two of you together, you really complement each other. Um, so look, I'm really looking forward to seeing your show. Uh, maybe you'll do the one man show down the line. Uh, before I let you go though, it's time for one more quick brain hack. So uh, I'm gonna write okay. down something here in a moment, but before I do, look at me, I want you to think of a number, but make it a like a pin number. So a four digit number. So think of a four digit number right now that I couldn't possibly know, okay? Now look at me. Uh, just put up your left hand up like this, your left hand like this. Good. And let me just look at your fingers. Just imagine that you're at like a, a pass machine or an ATM machine as they would call it in the States. Don't move your hand now, but imagine that you're plugging in the first digit. Don't move. Just imagine that you're plugging in the first digit. Interesting there. What was the first digit that you just plugged in your mind? Go ahead. Name it out loud. The first digit just. Five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got the five. Okay, put out your finger like this this time. Put out your finger like this this time. And imagine, don't move your hand, but just imagine that you're plugging in the second digit. Don't say anything. Just imagine one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, what was the second digit that you plugged in there? Eight. I got a bang on an eight? <laughs> you're a weirdo. I know, I know. Okay, focus on the last two digits. Now, I want everybody to know okay. we didn't set anything up. You have no idea how I'm doing this, right? Well Okay, no, look no. at me, focus on the last two digits, but this time don't use your hands. Just slowly say the numbers out loud. Just say zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to nine. Just say those numbers out loud. Go ahead. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, stop, eight. Stop, stop, just say seven again. Seven. Okay, good. All right. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to go with this. All right. Uh, like, is this actually your pin number, by the way? It's a number that I use for, for things, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> not, name it's it not out. too important. I'm not too worried about your hacking me, bank. <laughs> okay, Grant, name it out loud. Go ahead. What number did you think of? Five. So what was the full number, the full four-digit number? Uh, 5858. Five, eight. Just like that? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> hey. I'm glad I didn't pick my pin number, Jesus. I'm glad you did as well. At least you don't have to change it now. So we'll put the link to Keith and Boys Life Socials in the comments below. Be sure to follow them, check them out. They are both amazing. And together, as I said, you'll see an amazing show. Keith Duffy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on The Brain Hacker Show. Thanks, Keith. Good to see you, buddy. Good to, good to see your face and hear your voice. Thanks, same. Thanks.